Enrique's Journey by Sonia Nazario Chapter 4 Facing the Beast Enrique wades chest deep across the Rio Suchiate. The river forms a border. Behind him is Guatemala. Before him is Mexico's southernmost state, Chiapas. Ahora nos enfrentamos a la bestia. Now we face the beast, migrants say when they enter Chiapas. Enrique will risk the beast again because he needs to find his mother. This is his eighth attempt to reach El Norte. The water is the color of coffee with too much cream. Each time he crosses, as the rainy season approaches, the river is higher and higher. He is stoop-shouldered and cannot swim. The logo on his cap boasts Holloway, no fear. He, also, he always crosses with one or two other migrants in case he slips and starts to drown. Chin high, he staggers across, stumbling on the uneven riverbed, straining against the current. Exhausted, he reaches the far bank. Enrique has discovered several important things about the state of Chiapas. In Chiapas, do not take buses. Buses pass through nine permanent immigration checkpoints. Trains pass through checkpoints as well, but Enrique can jump off a train as it breaks. Inside a bus, he would be stuck. In Chiapas, never ride trains alone. The best time to move forward is at night or when there is a fog. Then he can see immigration agents' flashlights, but the agents cannot see him. In Chiapas, do not trust anyone. Residents tend to dislike migrants. Even the authorities, including police and immigration agents, are corrupt and may rob or rape you. With Central America safely, safely behind him, Enrique sneaks into a cemetery to rest. In the cemetery, he is close enough to the tracks to hear a train coming, its diesel engine growling and its horns blaring, but far enough away to avoid police who might be hovering around the station looking for migrants. Enrique hopes there will be a train tomorrow. Missing one means waiting two or three days for the next train. He washes his mouth with urine, a home remedy for his aching broken teeth. He stuffs a few rags under his head for a pillow and slips into sleep. Sleeping among the dead is eerily calming. The cemetery is beautiful in the light of the yellow moon. The sky is midnight blue. Enrique can see stars around the ceiba trees that shroud the headstones. Crosses and crypts are painted periwinkle, neon green, and purple. A wind touches the tree branches and the leaves flutter and murmur in the gathering light. A bigger gust moves the vast branches, commanding them to dance. The same darkness and isolation that give the graveyard beauty, beauty also make it a place of great peril. There have been many harrowing atrocities in these dark spaces, between the tombstones, worst of all rape and murder. A young woman was found dead. She had been raped, then beaten with stones. Wake up! The warning is only a whisper, but Enrique hears it. The words are from a boy who was sleeping next to him. It is just before dawn. Five pickup trucks filled with police coast up to the cemetery, their lights out. Cops are striding through the maze of pathways, fanning out among the graves, armed with rifles, shotguns, and pistols. Enrique hears migrants trying to run, stampeding among the graves, but he knows there is no point. Weeks ago, he tried to flee from police in this very cemetery. He was caught and deported. Trying not to breathe, he, flattened himself, he flattens himself on the mausoleum roof where he was sleeping. A policeman peers up over the edge of the crypt and straight at him. There is no escape. Enrique and the other migrants are marched off to the Tapachula jail. Name, age, where are you from? The policeman bark, taking notes. The migrants are led into an enclosed patio. They wait anxiously. Soon they will be shoved into a packed jail cell, then deported. As they mill about, the rumor starts going around. A train headed north is leaving at 10 a.m. I can't miss it, Enrique says to himself. Urgently, he looks around. How can he escape? Walls surround the patio, and migra agents are standing nearby. Enrique sees an old bicycle leaning against the wall. Now he watches La Migra carefully. For a moment, they look distracted. He climbs on top of the bicycle. Other migrants hoist him higher. He grabs a water pipe and pulls himself over the wall and onto the roof of an adjoining house. He jumps, and the soles of his feet, of his feet smack onto the ground. His head pounds, and it is still swollen from being battered, but he is free. 
Before La Migra can notice, Enrique runs back toward the cemetery to hide until 10 a.m. At the first rumble of the departing train, the cemetery comes to life as dozens of migrants, children among them, appear from behind the bushes, trees, and tombs where they had been hiding. On this day, March 26, 2000, Enrique is among them. Two days ago, he was battered in Las Anonas. Yesterday, he was shuttled back to Guatemala on their deportation bus. Now he and the other migrants run on trails between the graves and dash headlong down a hill. A sewage canal 20 feet wide separates them from the train rails. They cross the canal on seven stones, jumping from one to another over a nauseating stream of black water. They gather on the other side, shaking the dampness from their feet. Now they are only yards away from the rails. Enrique sprints alongside rolling freight cars, focusing on his footing. The roadbed is slanted at a 45-degree angle and scattered with rocks as big as his fist. It is hard to keep his balance as his tattered sneakers. Here, the locomotives accelerate, sometimes reaching 25 miles per hour. He knows he needs to be speedy and climb up the ladder before the train reaches a bridge just beyond the cemetery. If he runs too slowly when he tries to climb up, the ladder will yank him forward and send him sprawling. Then the churning wheels could take an arm, a leg, perhaps his life. Se lo comió el tren. The train ate him up, other migrants will say. Already Enrique has four jagged scars on his shins from, shins from frenzied efforts to board trains. The lowest rung of the ladder is waist high. When the train leans away, it is higher. If the train hits a curve, the wheels kick up hot white sparks burning Enrique's skin. By this time around, he has learned that if he overthinks all of this too long, he will fall behind and the train will pass him by. Enrique grabs one of its ladders, summons his strengths, and pulls himself up. He is aboard. Enrique looks ahead on the train. Men and boys are hanging on the sides of tank cars, trying to find a spot to sit or stand. Enrique, suddenly, Enrique hears screams. Three cars away, a boy, 12 or 13 years old, has managed to grab the bottom rung of a ladder of an, on a fuel tanker, but he cannot haul himself up. Air rushing beneath the train is sucking his legs under the car. It is tugging at him harder, drawing his feet towards the wheels. Pull yourself up, a man calls. Don't let go, another man shouts. He and others crawl along the top of the train to a nearby car. They hope to reach the boy's car before he is so exhausted he must let go. By then, his tired arms would have little strength left to push away from the train's wheels. Enrique gasps at the, as the boy dangles from the ladder. The boy is struggling to keep his grip. Carefully, men crawl down and reach for him. They lift him up slowly. The, rung, the rungs batter his legs, but he is alive. He still has his feet. Danger. There are few women on board the train today. It is too dangerous. A University of Houston study found that nearly one in six migrant girls detained by authorities in Texas say they have been sexually assaulted during their journey. Many female migrants are gang raped. One of them was a Salvadorian woman, four months pregnant, who was assaulted at gunpoint by 13 bandits along the railroad tracks to the south. The rape victims arrive at hospitals with severe internal, internal bleeding and long scratch marks on their bodies. Some get pregnant. A few go mad. In one Chiapa shelter, one raped woman paces, her arms tightly crossed in front of her, a blank stare on her face. At another shelter, a woman spends hours each day in the shower trying to cleanse herself of the attack. Some girls journeying north cut off their hair, bind their breasts, and try to pass for boys. Others squirrel on their chest. Tengo sida, I have AIDS, to scare men off. Men are also targets of rape and sexual assault. Rape is one way Mexicans demean and humiliate Central Americans, who are sometimes seen as inferior because they come from less developed countries, says Olivia Ruiz, a cultural anthropologist at El Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Tijuana. The Iron Horse Migrants hang onto the sides of cars, trying to find a spot to perch. Enrique guesses there are more than 200 on board, a small army of them who charged out of the cemetery with nothing but their cunning. They wage what a priest at a migrant shelter calls la guerra sin nombre, the war with no name. Chiapas, he says, is a cemetery with no crosses, where people die without even getting a prayer. A human rights report said that migrants trying to make it through Chiapas face an, on, an authentic race against time and death. Enrique considers carefully, which car will he ride on? This time he will be more cautious about being seen. 
He could lie flat on the roof of a boxcar and hide, but boxcars have little on top to hold on to. Inside the boxcar might be better, but what if someone locked the door, trapping him? It could turn into an oven. Enrique looks elsewhere. A good place to hide could be under the cars, balancing on a small shock absorber, but he might be too big to fit. Besides, trains kick up rocks. Worse, if his arms grew tired or if he fell asleep, he could drop directly under the wheels. He tells himself, that's crazy. He could stand on a tiny ledge, barely big enough for his feet, on the end of a hopper car. Or he could sit on the round compressor at the end of some hoppers, his feet dangling just above the train wheels, shiny metal, three feet in diameter, five inches thick, churning. His hands would turn numb after hours of hanging on, though. Enrique settles for the top of a hopper. From his perch 14 feet up, he can see anyone approaching on either side of the tracks up ahead or from another car. As usual, the train lurches hard from side to side. Enrique holds on with both hands. He doesn't carry anything that might keep him from running fast. At most, a plastic bottle for water tied to his arm. Some migrants climb on board with a tooth toothbrush tucked into a pocket. A few allow themselves a small reminder of family, maybe a rosary or a Bible or a tiny drawing of San Cristobal, the patron saint of travelers, or of San Judas Tadeo, the patron saint of desperate situations. One father wraps his eight-year-old daughter's favorite hairband around his wrist. There are several children on board, and Grupo Beta, the government migrant rights groups in Chiapas, estimates that 20 to 30 percent of migrants who board here are 15 or younger. Enrique has encountered kids at y as young as nine. Some speak only with big brown eyes or a shy smile. Others talk openly about their mothers. I felt alone. I only talked to her on the phone. I didn't like that. I want to see her. When I see her, I'm going to hug her a lot with everything I have. Enrique nods understandingly as they speak. He confides in them, too. They share the burden of their loneliness. Although Enrique's efforts to survive often force thoughts of his mother out of his mind, at times he thinks of her with a longing that is overwhelming. He remembers when she would call Honduras from the United States, the concern in her voice, how she would not hang up before saying, I love you, I miss you. Wheels rumble, screech and clang. The train speeds up and slows down unpredictably, tossing the travelers backward and forward. Sometimes each car rocks the other way from the ones ahead and behind. Migrants call the train El Gusano de Buero, the Iron Worm, for how it squirms up the tracks. In Chiapas, the tracks are 20 years old. Some of the ties sink, especially during the rainy season, when the roadbed turns soggy and soft. Grass grows on the rails, making them slippery. Slippery. When the cars round a bend, they feel as if they might overturn. Derailments are common. The train Enrique is on runs only a few times a week, but it derails three times a month on average, with 17 accidents in a particularly bad month, by the count of Jorge Reynoso, the railroad's chief of operations in Chiapas. One year before, a hopper car like Enrique's overturned with a load of sand burying three migrants alive. In another spot, six hoppers tumbled over. The car's rusty remains lie scattered upside down next to the tracks. Enrique was once on a train that derailed. His car lurched so violently that he briefly thought of jumping off to save himself. Enrique rarely lets himself admit to being afraid, but he is scared that his car might tip. He holds on with both hands. In spite of his fear, Enrique is struck by the magic of the train, its power and speed, and above all, its ability to take him to his mother, to Enrique, it is El Caballo de Hierro, the Iron Horse. Other migrants believe the train has a noble purpose. Sometimes the train tops are packed with migrants, all facing north toward a new land. El Tren Peregrino, they call it, the Pilgrim's Train. The train picks up speed. It passes a brown river that smells of sewage. A dark form emerges, emerges ahead. Migrants at the front of the train call back a warning over the train's deafening din. They sound an alarm, migrant to migrant, car to car. Rama! The migrants yell. Branch! The train is hurtling toward a thick canopy of tree branches. Enrique and the other riders sway in unison, ducking the same branches left and right. One moment of carelessness, a glance down at a watch, a look toward the back of the train at the wrong moment, and the branches will, will hurl them into the air. A dreaded stop. Each time the train slows, Enrique goes on high alert for La Migra. Migrants wake one another and begin climbing down to prepare to jump. 
They lean outward, trying to glimpse what is causing the train to change pace. Is it another false alarm, a bad curve, a migrant disconnecting the brake line, or a conductor pulling off onto a siding to let another train pass? Can all cause a train to slow. If the train speeds up again, everyone climbs back up. The movement down and up the ladders looks almost choreographed. Slowing down in Ixla, there with its red and yellow depot, can mean only one thing. La Arrocera is coming up. La Arrocera is the immigration checkpoint. Enrique fears most. It is in an isolated agricultural area with a few houses or busy streets where migrants can hide. Usually half of those aboard the train here are caught by migra agents. Enrique decides he will jump off the train, run around the checkpoint, and catch up with the train so he can reboard it on the other side. He arrives in the heat of noon. Tension builds. Some migrants stand on top of the train to see if migra agents are up ahead. The first migrants who spot agents down the tra tracks scream a warning to the others. Bajense! Get down! As the train breaks, migrants jump. The train stops. Enrique lies flat, face down, arms spread eagle, hoping La Migra won't see him. But several agents do. Sometimes Mexican immigration authorities put people on the train who pretend to be migrants. The imposters radio ahead to tell agents where migrants are hidden and how many are on each train. Enrique scrambles to his feet and races along the top of the train, soaring across the four-foot gaps between cars. As he runs, three agents run alongside him on the ground, pelting him with rocks and sticks. Stones clang against the metal. Alto! Alto! Stop! Stop! The agents holler. There is no ladder all the way to the top. The only way agents can reach him is to straddle their legs across two adjoining boxcars, using the horizontal ridges on the edges of the car to inch higher. Maybe they won't come up after him. Bajate! Get down! They shout. They curse at him. No, I'm not coming down! He shouts back. The agents summon reinforcements. One starts to climb, shimmying up the side of a boxcar. Enrique flees from car to car, more than 20 cars in all, struggling to keep his footing each time he leaps from a hopper to a fuel tanker, which is lower and has a rounded top. He is running out of train to stand on. He will have to jump off and go around the, uh, the La Arrocera checkpoint on foot, alone. It may be suicidal, but he has no choice. More stones fly through the air. They miss him and bounce off the train with a ping. Enrique scurries down a ladder and sprints into the bushes. As Enrique runs, he hears what he thinks are gunshots behind him. Mexican immigration agents are prohibited from carrying firearms. According to a retired agent, however, most ignore the rule and carry pistols anyways. Workers at a local, local migrant shelter tell of migrants who have been hit by bullets. Others tell of torture. Enrique once met a man whose chest was scarred with cigarette burns. The man told him that a migra agent at La Arrocera branded him. In the brush, though, Enrique worries less about the agents than about what awaits him in the woods. Swarms of bandits, some carrying Uzis, some on drugs, patrol this three-mile dirt path he will have to use to go around La Arrocera. Whereas gangsters rule on the train tops, bandits stay in the isolated areas like this. Human rights activists and some police agencies say these bandits commit some of the worst atrocities, rapes and torture. They split what they steal from their victims with the police, who allow them to operate freely. Migrants hide their money in case they are caught by robbers. Some stitch it into the seams of their pants. Others put a bit in their shoes, a bit in their shirts, or a few coins in their mouths. Still, others tuck money into their underwear. Others hollow out mangoes, drop their pesos inside, then pretend to be eating the fruit. Enrique figures he doesn't have enough money to bother hiding it. He knows bandits catch on to these hiding places anyways. They split open waistbands, collars, and cuffs looking for money. Local residents see groups of migrants walking down dirt roads naked, stripped of everything, just as Enrique had been back in Las Anonas. Migrants who fight back are beaten, or worse. The bandits warn, if you say anything to the authorities, we will find you and kill you. The police force itself is involved in crime and cannot be relied on for help. Many of the bandits are current or former police officers, says Grupo Beta Sur, Sur Supervisor Mario Campos Gutierrez. If these bandits are arrested, they pay bribes to police headquarters and are quickly released without any consequences. Witnesses' statements against them mysteriously disappear. For migrants, going to police authorities would be dangerous anyway because they could be deported. Because migrants are on the run, they cannot wait around for months until a trial to testify against the bandits. This makes them ideal victims for robbers to attack. 
Migrants have asked members of Grupo Beta Sur why the authorities don't clamp down on the gangsters. Grupo Beta Sur agents told them they needed witnesses. They urged the migrants to step forward and report abuses. One teenager who did was brutally beaten by Mara Salvatrucha gangsters later that day. And bandits long ago intimidated any La Arrocera residents who considered testifying. If you say anything, they kill you. Better to keep your mouth shut, says a local elderly man who is afraid to give his full name. An ice cream vendor near La Arrocera adds, If you turn them in, they get out and they come after you. They operate by light of day. There is no law here. The last time Enrique sneaked past La Arrocera, he was lucky because he was careful. He stuck with a band of street gangsters. Bandits try to avoid gangsters who are likely to be armed. They prefer to attack someone who cannot shoot back. Enrique and the gangsters ran past a group of Mexican man's, men standing by the tracks, machetes at their sides. The men looked at them intently but did not move or attack. This time, Enrique is alone. He focuses on the thought that will make him run the fastest. I cannot miss the train. If he misses the one he just left, he knows he will be waiting for days in the bushes and tall grass until another one comes. Enrique races so fast he feels the blood pounding at his temples. Long, wet grass coils around his feet. He stumbles but never stops running. Enrique crawls under a barbed wire fence, then under a double strand of smooth wire. It is electrified. At night, locals who live along the train tracks hear the piercing screams of migrants who have been electrocuted by this wire. Help me! Help me! They wail. These locals have also found train riders who have lost arms, legs, or heads along the tracks. Migrants who were injured as they tried to outrun the agents and get onto and off of moving trains. He reaches the Cuil Bridge, which spans a stream of murky brown water. The bridge, migrants and Grupo Beta Sur officers say, is the most dangerous spot. Bandits hide in trees, waiting to pounce on migrants. They use children as lookouts in exchange for a coin or a piece of candy. The children race ahead on their bicycles to tell the bandits when migrants are drawing near. As migrants near the bridge, the bandits drop down and surround them. Other robbers hide along the tracks on the bridge and below it, an area thick with bushes and vines. One bandit fishes in the river or cuts grass with a machete like a field worker and whistles to the others to set a trap. Enrique dashes across the bridge and keeps his pace. If there are bandits in the distance, he does not notice them. Mountains stand to his right, the ground so wet that farmers grow rice between their rows of corn. He can feel humidity rising from the loomy earth. It saps his energy, but he runs on. Finally, he stops, doubled over, panting. He is not sure why, but he has survived La Arrocera. Maybe it was his extra caution. Maybe it was that he never stopped running. Maybe it was his decision to hide atop the boxcar instead of jumping off immediately, which meant that bandits targeted migrants ahead of him. He is desperate for water. He spots a house. The people inside are not likely to give him any. The people of Chiapas are fed up with Central American migrants. Central Americans are poorer than Mexicans, and here they are seen as backward and ignorant. People think they bring disease, prostitution, and crime and take away jobs. They tell of a man from Chiapas who sold chickens in a market and was so kind to outsiders. He gave three Salvadorians a place to sleep and work slaughtering and plucking birds. The Salvadorians robbed and killed him. Migrants like Enrique are called stinking undocumented. They are cursed, taunted. Dogs are set upon them. Barefoot children throw rocks at them. Some use slings slingshots and shout, Go to work and get out. Get out. Drinking water can be impossible to come by. Migrants filter ditch sewage through t-shirts. Finding food can be just as difficult. Enrique is counting. In some places, people at seven or every ten houses turn him away. No, they say, we haven't cooked today. We don't have any tortillas. Try somewhere else. They press the door closed in his face. Many La Arrocera residents lock themselves inside their homes when they hear the train coming. Sometimes it is worse. People in the houses turn the migrants in. Enrique sees another migrant who has managed to make it around La Arrocera. He too needs water badly, but he doesn't dare ask. To migrants, begging in Chiapas is like walking up to a loaded gun. I'll go, Enrique says. If they catch someone, it will be me. Enrique also knows he is less likely to frighten people if he begs alone. Enrique approaches the house and speaks softly, his head slightly bowed. I'm hungry. Can you spare a taco? Some water? 
The woman inside sees his injuries from the train top beating he took during his last attempt to go north. She gives him water, bread, and beans. The other migrant comes nearer. She gives him food, too. A horn blows. Enrique runs to the tracks. He looks all around, trying to spot migra agents who sometimes race ahead in their trucks to catch migrants as they reboard. Other migrants who have survived La Rosera come out of the bushes. They sprint alongside the train and reach for the ladders on the freight cars. Sometimes train drivers back up the locomotive and get a running start. They accelerate to prevent migrants from reboarding up ahead. This time, though, the train isn't going full throttle. Enrique climbs up onto a hopper. The train picks up speed. For the moment, he relaxes. Waiting in Honduras. Meanwhile, Enrique's girlfriend, Maria Isabel, is sure Enrique hasn't really left Honduras. This is all a joke, she thinks. He has probably gone to visit a friend. He'll be back one day. A couple of weeks after he disappears, Maria Isabel realizes it is no joke. Maria Isabel knows Enrique longed to be with his mother. He spoke often of going north to be with Lourdes. Still, how could he leave her? What if he is harmed or killed crossing Mexico? What if she never sees him again? Tearfully, she prays he will be caught and deported back to Honduras, back by her side. She doesn't feel well and loses weight. She quits night school. What if she is pregnant and Enrique dies trying to make it to his mother? Then she will be alone, raising their child. She makes a plan to follow Enrique north, to find him in Mexico or in the United States, but she has no money. She fears being assaulted or raped. Raped. Her family scolds her. Are you crazy? You want to die along the way? If you are pregnant, they tell her, you could lose the child on the road. Maria Isabel listens in silence. She knows they are right. All she can do now is wait. Heat waves. The iron worm squeaks, groans, and clanks its way north. Enrique eyes the scenery over the edge of the hopper car he is riding. Off to the right are hillsides covered with coffee plants. Corn stalks grow up against the rails. The train moves through a sea of plantation trees, lush and tropical. By early afternoon, and it's 105 degrees, the sun reflects off the metal of the train, stinging Enrique's eyes, draining the little energy he has left. His head still throbs. His skin tingles as he breaks into a full bloodied sweat. He moves around on the car, chasing patches of shade. Finally, he strips off his shirt and sits on it. The locomotive blows warm diesel smoke. People burn trash by the rails, sending up more heat and searing stench. Many of the migrants aboard have had their caps stolen, so they wrap their heads in t-shirts. They gaze enviously at villagers cooling themselves in streams and washing off after a day of field work, and at others who doze in hammocks slung in shady spots near a boat adobe and cinder block homes. The train cars sway from side to side, up and down like bobbing ice cubes. Enrique's palms burn when he holds on to the harper. He risks riding no hands. He cannot let himself fall asleep. One good shake of the train and he would tumble off. Other migrants have caught, taught him tricks on how to stay awake. Slap your, slap your own face, they say. Do squats. Pour drops of alcohol into your eyes. Sing. Do anything to keep yourself from getting tired. At 4 a.m., the train sounds like a chorus. Mara Salvatrucha street gangsters always prowl the train tops in Chiapas in groups of 10 or 20 looking for sleepers. Many gangsters settle in Chiapas after committing crimes in the United States and being deported to their home countries in Central America. Gangsters say the police target and kill them in Central America, so they've settled in Mexico and made a good business robbing migrants on top of the trains. Before a train leaves, they try to figure out which migrants are the best targets, which ones have money or food, which ones are weakest. They try to get friendly with the migrants, telling them they have already done the train ride. Maybe they can offer tips. Enrique knows to watch for anyone with tattoos, especially gangsters who have skulls inked around their ankles. One skull, some say, for every person they have killed. Some wear black knit hats they can pull down over their faces. Their brutality is legendary. Often they are high on marijuana or crack cocaine. Drugs embolden them. They are armed with machetes, knives, bats, and pistols. When the train gains speed, they surround a group of migrants. They tell them, hand over your money or die. A train engineer, Emilio Canteros Mendez, often sees the armed gangs through his rearview mirror. Fights erupt on top of the boxcars. Migrants who anger the gangsters because they don't have money or resist are regularly tossed off moving trains or left dead on the top of the cars to be discovered by train workers at the next stop. 
Enrique has heard of the two most dangerous gangsters, El Indio, who claims the, Wat the Guatemalan side of the Mexican border, and Blackie, a chubby Salvador Salvadorian with dark skin and MS tattooed on his forehead, whose territory stretches from the border to Arriaga in northern Chiapas. During one of his first attempts to go north, a chance meeting saved Enrique from the worst of the gangs. As he set out on his trip, he noticed another teenager, a gangster named El Brujo, at the bus station in Honduras waiting to go to the Mexican border. Enrique doesn't like gangs, but as the two spent hours traveling through Honduras and Guatemala together, he and El Brujo became friends. On their first train ride through Chiapas, El Brujo introduced Enrique to other teenage MS members. There was Big Daddy, a skinny and short teenager, and El Payaso, the clown, who had a big mouth and eyes. Sticking with these gang members protected him from attacks along the way. On his seventh trip, the convenient relationship ended. One of the MS gangers is upset because a member of the rival gang, an 18th Streeter, had stolen his shirt. He decides to throw the 18th Streeter off the train. Enrique refuses to participate, creating a rift. If you are MS, you have to kill 18th Streeters. And if you are 18th Street, you must kill MS. I wasn't like that, Enrique says. After the fight, the gang members stop riding with Enrique. That night, without their protection, he is beaten by the six men on top of the train. Now that he is riding alone, he must stay extra alert. He is terrified of another beating. Every time someone new jumps onto his car, he tenses. Fear, he realizes, is a tool he can use to keep himself awake. He climbs on top of the tank car and takes his running leap. With arms spread as if he were flying, he jumps to one swaying box cart, then another. Some cars are nine feet apart. The train passes into northern Chiapas. Enrique sees men with hoes tending their corn and women inside their kitchens patting tortillas into shape. Cowboys ride past and smile. Field workers wave their machetes and cheer the migrants on. Que bueno! Mountains draw closer. Plains and fields soften into pastures. Enrique's train slows to a crawl. Monarch butterflies flutter alongside, overtaking his car. As the sun sets and the oppressive heat breaks, he hears crickets and frogs begin their music and join the migrant chorus. The moon rises. Thousands of fireflies flicker around the train. Stars come out to shine. So many they seem jammed together, the brilliant points of light all across the sky. The train nears San Ramon, close to the northern state line. This is where police stage their biggest shakedowns, but it is past midnight now and the judicial police are probably asleep. Mario Campos Gutierrez, the Grupo Beta Sur supervisor, supervisor, estimates that half of those who try to migrate north eventually get here after repeated attempts. Migrants know getting this far means conquering the toughest part of the journey. As one migrant put it, when I get to this point, I begin to sing hallelujah. Enrique greets the dawn without incident. If the stars recede, the sky lightens behind the mountains to the east and mist rises off the fields on both sides of the tracks. Men trot by on burros with tin milk containers strapped to their saddles, starting their morning deliveries. He puts Chiapas behind him. He still has far to go, but he has faced this beast in the state eight times now, and he has lived through it. It is an achievement, and he is proud of it. Devoured Many migrants who first set out on the train with Enrique have been caught and deported. Others have fared worse. They are left broken by Chiapas. As Enrique slowly recovers from his beating, he hears horror stories from other migrants of riders who are mutilated by the train itself. The Red Cross estimates that every other day in Chiapas alone, a migrant riding the freight trains loses an arm, leg, hand, or foot. This estimate does not include people who die instantly. One police chief keeps snapshots of the dead in a black book. He keeps the book handy, hoping someone will identify the bodies. No one ever comes to look. A young Honduran 17-year-old Carlos Roberto Diaz Osorto lies in bed number one of the trauma unit at Hospital Civil in southern Mexico. Four days before he was brought in, Carlos had seen a man get both legs cut off by a freight train, but he had pushed fear out of his mind. He was going to the United States to find work. Carlos had almost crossed Chiapas. Racing alongside a train, he asked, himself, he asked himself, should I get on or not? His cousins, who were... Uh, sorry. His cousins who were running with him grabbed on the six 
car from the end. Carlos panicked. Would be, he be left behind? The train comes to a bridge. Carlos did not give up. His shoelaces were loose. His left shoe flew off. Then his right shoe. He reached for a ladder on a fuel tanker, but the car was moving too fast and he let go. He grabbed a railing. The tanker jerked hard. Carlos held on, but he could feel air rushing beneath the car, sucking his legs in close to the wheels. His fingers uncurled. He tried to bounce his feet off the wheels and push away, but as he let go, the air pulled him in. The wheels flattened his right foot, then sliced through his left leg above the knee. Help me! Help me! It hurts! He screamed. He began to pant, to sweat, to ask for water, not sure anyone could hear him. Paramedics from the Mexican Red Cross found him lying by the tracks. He had lost nearly a third of his blood. A doctor cut his bones, then sealed every artery in vain. He stretched skin over the openings and stitched them shut. Sometimes there are no drugs available to staff off infection, but Carlos was lucky. The Red Cross located some penicillin. Many migrants who lose limbs to the train end up back in Tapachula, a dozen blocks from where they first boarded the train, at the shelter of Jesus the Good Shepherd. The shelter director, Olga Sanchez Martinez, tries to heal immigrants left deeply wounded by the beast. Olga is a petite middle-aged woman with silky black hair down to her hips and a simple white rosary strung around her neck. She is always in motion, impatient to find solutions to problems. She nurses the migrants until they can be taken back home. The injured migrants seethe with, ang seethe with anger. They curse God. Why didn't he protect them? Their eyes speak fear. Who will ever marry them like this? How will they ever work again? Let me die, they say. She perches on the edge of their hospital beds. She strokes their hair. God has a plan for you, she says. You will learn to live in a different way. She tells them her story, how an intestinal disease contracted when she was seven, which went untreated because her family had no money for medicine, led to a life of being gravely ill. At times she was blind, mute. Once she was in a coma for 38 days. Once she was down to 66 pounds, just skin and bones. Once she was working at a tortilla factory, a machine tore off her two fingertips. She tells them to, she tried to slit her wrists. One day her doctor told her she had cancer and only months to live. What would become of her two small children? She wasn't very religious, but she went to church that day, kneeled and made a pact with God. Heal me, and I will heal others. She studied the Bible. It told her to help the weak, the hungry. She began visiting patients at a local hospital. One year later, she saw a 13-year-old boy, Salvadorian boy, who had lost both legs boarding a train. She walked home in tears. How, she asked God, could you be so cruel? She taught herself, watching doctors, how to dress the migrants' wounds. She began taking migrants who had been kicked out of the hospital into her humble home. In 1999, she opened the four-bedroom migrant shelter in a little former tortilla factory someone lent her. She confesses it has not been easy. She works for free, from dawn until late at night, seven days a week, to obtain money for food, units of blood, medicine, and prophecies. She raises money, selling food in the streets and going from car to car, begging with a picture of mutilated migrants she's trying to help. People often tell her she's crazy to help foreigners who could be robbers or murderers, and that she should help Mexicans instead. Sometimes she loses her patience with God. She can't always quickly come up with the money to buy the blood or medicine migrants need to fight for their lives. What do you want me to do? She asks God great angrily. Some migrants are too battered by the beast to save. A 13-year-old girl who was raped by the side of the tracks and left with a broken neck and shattered hips. She could not move or talk. Olga buried that girl and 39 others. She tries to buy them each a wooden coffin so they can be lowered into the ground with some dignity. Otherwise, their bodies would be lowered, nameless, into common graves in Tapachula. But most slowly recuperate under Olga's care. A young man who has lost both feet fears going back to his small town in Honduras where he won't be able to walk the hill, hilly dirt paths, grow beans or coffee or corn, or play soccer with friends. You are going to walk again, Olga says, vowing to get him prophecies. A teenage girl who lost who lost her right foot fears her husband will leave her. Don't cry, Olga sues her. God wants people who are useful. You must keep going forward. You have your hands. You must go forward and trust in God. 
Each night when she hears the train whistle, she asks God to protect the migrants from the trains and the assaults. Oaxaca Enrique reaches Oaxaca, the next state north of Chiapas. He is now 285 miles into Mexico. As the train squeals to a stop around noon, migrants jump down and look for houses where they can beg for water and a bite to eat. La Bestia might be behind them, but most of all, but most are still afraid. In these small towns, strangers stick out. Migrants are especially easy to spot. They wear dirty clothes and smell bad after days or weeks without bathing. Often they have no socks. Their shoes are battered. They have been bitten by mosquitoes. They look exhausted. Most of the migrants want to hide in bushes on their grassy slope by the tracks in case there is a migra raid. Two boys standing near Enrique are too frightened to go into town. They offer Enrique 20 pesos and ask him to buy food. If he will bring it back, they will share it with him. Blending in is critical. If he doesn't look like a local, the police might search him and deport him. Enrique takes off his yellow shirt. It is stained and smelling of diesel smoke. Underneath, he wears a white one, which he takes off and then puts back on over the dirty one. Throughout his journey, he has tried to stay clean by finding bits of cardboard to sleep on. When he gets a bottle of water, he saves a little to wash his arms. If he is near a river or stream, he strips and slips into the water. He begs for clean clothes or scrubs the ones he has been wearing and lays them on the river bank to dry. Maybe he can pass for someone who lives here. He resolves not to panic as if he sees a policeman and to walk confidently as if he knows where he is going. He takes the pesos the two migrant boys have given him and walks down the main street, past a bar, a store, a bank, and a pharmacy. He buys enough food for the three of them and stashes it. Then he stops at a barber's shop. His curly hair has grown long. It is an easy tip-off. People here tend to have straight hair. He strides purposely inside. Orale jefe, he says, using a phrase Oaxacan's favor. Hey, chief. He mutes his flat Central American accent and speaks softly in a sing-songy way like a Oaxacan. He asks the barber for a short crop military style. He says he pays with the last of his own money, careful not to call it pisto, as they do back home. Up here, pisto doesn't mean money, it means alcohol. He is careful not to slip up. Enrique glances into a store window and sees his reflection. It is the first time he has looked at his face since he was beaten. He recoils from what he sees, scars and bruises, black and blue. One eyelid droops. It sto stops him. They really screwed me up, he mutters. He was five years old when his mother left him. Now he is almost another person. In the window glass, he sees a battered young man, scrawny and disfigured. He is underweight and his eyes are sunken in with dark circles of exhaustion. What Enrique sees angers him. It steals his determination to push northward.